Hey everyone, happy Wednesday. Thanks for joining us for another Encore Study Group. Today we're going to be talking about Lisp and VXLAN. And I know we're still trying very hard to get to the Software Defined Access Fabric operation. It's what we've been trying to get to for a while now, but we just got so many things to cover and really it's all about laying the groundwork for actually getting to the point that we can talk about fabric operation. So as we look at today's agenda, really again, we're just going to be talking about Lisp and VXLAN. And most of the conversation is going to be Lisp. Lisp is definitely the larger cookie to try to consume, if that's an analogy anywhere. But either way, we're going to be spending probably about three quarters of our time today on Lisp. And then at the end, we'll definitely cover VXLAN. It's just, you know, VXLAN is pretty straightforward. It's a layer two tunneling mechanism. So we'll give the information that we can on it. And from there, we'll have, hopefully, all be armed and equipped with the information that we need in order to finally, again, talk about software defined access as fabric operation um, moving forward. So uh, there's a lot to cover today, so we're going to jump right in. But for those who are new or it's been a while since you've joined us, thank you for coming. This has been pre-recorded. We're doing a YouTube live session. It's not live. It's premiere, I suppose. But I'm in the chat right now ready to answer any questions. I expect there to be some questions on Lisp and VXLAN, so do not hesitate to chime into the chat. Ask whatever questions you want. VXLAN and Lisp, the reason we're covering these is because we're going through uh, the whole software to find access section. For those who are studying for Encore, as you know, SD Access is a big part of this exam. We need to be comfortable with the concepts. And at the core of how SDA operates, we're running Lisp. We're running VXLAN. We have to have these protocols at a level. We have to be at a certain level of comfort with these protocols in order to really pass the exam, ultimately, which is the goal. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. And we need to understand... Uh, First and foremost, that Lisp was not designed for software-defined access. Neither was VXLAN, by the way. They were designed to solve problems in different parts of the network. And what we're going to find is Cisco looked at those and said, hey, if we pluck Lisp, which, you know, Cisco developed Lisp, so plucking Lisp wasn't that big of a deal. But we pluck Lisp from the service provider space and we grab VXLAN from the data center space we can really create something special with software-defined access, a software-defined networking infrastructure for the campus environment. And so, again, let's step into the service provider world here for a moment. Let's just think about, I just drew a bunch of routers onto the screen here, um, a lot of them connected or what have you, but just imagine, if you will, that this is the internet. Uh, probably not the entire internet, I mean, not certainly not that small, but maybe it's an autonomous system somewhere, BGP, AS, that's... We've got a cluster of routers that the internet service provider has. And let's think about this from a traditional routing perspective. If I've got a subnet out here, let's just call this subnet A, and I have a packet arriving on this router destined for subnet A, how do I get this packet across my internet service provider domain to the actual destination? Uh, we need to get to this router right here. And so the way we're going to do that is by exchanging routes everywhere. We've got BGP running uh, between autonomous systems. We probably have it running within our autonomous system, or we might have an IGP or ISIS running or something along those lines, just something that gets that traffic from the router on the left all the way to the router on the right. Now, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to check our routing table. And somewhere in this routing table, we have a path to subnet A. And so we're going to send that on to the next hop router. That router is going to look up its routing table and it's going to see that it has a path to subnet A. Now, in a lot of our networks, we might be following a default route in some situations, but in most service provider networks, we're not able to rely on a default route. The default route just sort of is the catch all. It points out towards the internet. And if we're smack dab in the middle of the internet, there isn't really a default route. You know, is, is it the service provider that's connected out? that AS number connection over there to the other BGP realm? Or is it is it that service provider or is it this service provider? Uh, at some point, there really isn't a default route that we can fall back and rely on. And so this is why it's so important that we have a route to network A. And so we keep hopping and we check the routing table here and we see that we have a route to A and we forward it on to the final router, which of course it's also got a routing table lookup to do. Even if A is directly attached, which it might not be, it might just be downstream. But either way, we forward it on to the destination. This is traditional networking. And this works. It works fine, fine enough, I suppose. Um, but not fine enough that we just want to leave it. I don't know. It's, it's not working fine enough such that we didn't have to create something to fix some problems. Well, the biggest problem that we have here 
is that every single router in the path had to know what? It had to know where subnet A lives. And so and that makes sense, right? I mean, if I'm a router and I receive a packet and I don't know where the destination is, I, I drop it. But, but there's a big flaw with this theory, and that is that ultimately what I'm trying to get to is I'm trying to get to this router here on the right. But in order to get to that router on the right, I have to know where subnet A lives. And not just subnet A, I need to know where every subnet lives that I might potentially forward towards. So on the internet, that essentially amounts to the entire internet routing table, which I, I boy, I should have looked this up beforehand. Are we close? To, we're, we're on our way towards a billion routes. Is that right? Um, I'll, I'll hopefully chime into the chat here if I'm wrong about that. Um, <clears throat> somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But either way, we're, we're looking at so many different routes on the internet. One of our greatest tools for combating the sprawling growth of the internet routing table was aggregation, right? We would aggregate our routes such that, okay, well, A, I could, I could maybe aggregate A through Z, maybe 26 or 32, probably a nicer binary number, right? A bunch of different subnets, and I could summarize those, essentially, route aggregation. I could summarize those into the routing core. And so now I have fewer subnets that I am tracking, except, except unfortunately, again, a lot of us don't live in the service provider world, so you might just have to take my word for this. But what we're doing a lot of these days is we're actually doing disaggregation of routes. We are relying and trusting on our routers being strong and beefy enough to be able to have the entire internet routing table to the point that we're actually taking some subnets and we're splitting them up. And the reason we're splitting them up is for traffic engineering. I might want, for example, if, if I've got uh, subnet B hanging off of this, it's going to sound silly to say this, but I might want B to go around this way. And so if I want B to go around that way, then I need a route um, A pointing this way for subnet A and route B pointing this way. And so in order, the only way I can do that is if I have different routes, which means that aggregating or summarizing all of these routes together, remember that A through Z concept where I've got 26 or whatever, however many subnets I have in there, if A and B are in there together, this isn't going to work. I can't send traffic for one route this way and another route, or, you know, same route subset of that route that way. It doesn't work. I have one route at that point. And this is why the internet service providers of the world have been segmenting off their, or at least splitting up their aggregation and their summarization. And so because we're no longer summarizing, I mean, you'd think that over time we'd be summarizing more and the routing table would be getting smaller. It's actually quite the opposite. The internet routing table continues to grow and it's a little bit out of control. So Cisco looked at this scenario and said, okay, this is not ideal, and what, but what can we do to fix it? You know, sometimes it takes just going to a, a whiteboard like this and saying, all right, if I could do whatever I wanted to make this work, if I could go back in time 30 years and redefine how the internet works, what would, 30 years ago actually isn't far back enough anymore, is it? But either way, we're going back in time, we're trying to fix the internet. What can we do in order to fix it? And so the solution that Cisco came up with was this concept of Lisp. So they created, actually I'll make it green because green is good, the Locator Identifier Separation Protocol or Lisp. The, the idea that they came up with was to say, okay, really what we need to do is get to this routing locator over here. I, I'm using a term that um, I'll define here in a moment, but this router really is what I'm trying to get to. And so behind this is a subnet that I also need to get to, but here's the thing. Something that all of these routers in the network already should know is how to get to this router. That router is part of the IGP or IBGP domain or whatever routing protocol I'm running, they should be able to get to that. And so if I'm sending a packet into this router and its destination is A, and I send that packet onto the routers, then they all need to know where A lives. But what if we package this up in a tunnel, and instead of saying that my destination now is A, that would be the inside of the tunnel, my original packet says destination A, but what if my tunnel's new destination is, uh, let's just call this like router 10 or something like that. So now my destination's router 10. If my destination's router 10, and 
which is and let me erase this big green circle that I made. If my destination is router 10, then what can I do? Whoops, there we go. Then what I need to do is send that packet in, but now at this point, this router knows where router 10 is. And so we're gonna do something very similar, except when we're looking up our routes, we're really looking for router 10. We're not looking for subnet A anymore. And so I send that on, same thing. They're gonna look up for router 10. And this looks the same as what we just did before, except think about how many routes that these routers now need to have. These routes, I'm sorry, these routers now need to have as many routes essentially as there are routers in the network. That's, that's it. I just need to know how to get to these routers for any subnets that they may own. So the goal of Lisp is to decrease the size of the routing tables in the service provider core. This is why Lisp was invented. Now the way Lisp works is what we're gonna be spending most of the rest of our time with, but this is essentially the, the gist of what Lisp is trying to accomplish. We're trying to bring packets in and encapsulate them into a tunnel and send them across a particular part of the internet. Now, uh, usually that part of the internet's going to be a BGP autonomous system or part of a service provider network. It's not going to be the entire internet. We, we can't scale Lisp out to that extreme and neither would we want to, by the way. It's, that, that kind of eliminates the point of it. Uh, the point of Lisp is to take a domain, a part of the internet, again, a BGP autonomous system in most cases, run Lisp in that domain, and now all of a sudden we're talking about routers that maybe go from 500 million routes to what? A few dozen routes? I, I mean, maybe even if it's hundreds of routes for all the, all the different routers that we might have in our domain, you're talking about such a huge decrease in the number of routes that now the money I have to spend on these routers goes down significantly. I, I hope everyone's understanding that. Please chime in with the chat or into the chat if you don't, uh, for those who are watching this live. But the the important part about this is the reduction of the routing table size for the routers that are in between. This exact same concept is going to be used in software defined access. We've talked a little bit about that already. And anytime we're using tunneling, that concept of tunneling, which used to just be like, honestly, tunneling was largely used other than like IPsec tunnels and tunnels out to remote sites. Tunneling was mostly used for CCNA labs and CCIE labs. <laughs> we weren't really setting up tunnels inside of a campus fabric or campus network, call it back in the day, five, 10 years ago. Um, but now all of our software defined infrastructures are coming out of software defined networking. Cisco is not the only one doing it this way. Every software defined networking solution out there is building it on tunnels. And part of the reason for that is because that way our underlay, remember this overlay underlay concept, the tunnels are part of the overlay, but now the underlay, it can be really dirt cheap networking gear. For the most part, we're just taking packets in, looking up a small, a route in a very small routing table relatively and just chucking on to the next top. That's all we need this device to do. And so that, that again, it makes it less, uh, or it makes it more affordable really in the service provider core, but it also just makes it so that the, the routing table lookups are faster. So it's gonna speed up uh, the amount of time that it takes for routers to process packets. It's, it's a fantastic solution. Again, it doesn't scale out to the entire internet at once, but it can scale out to an entire BGP autonomous system number, whatever part of the internet we're dealing with at the time. So <clears throat> here's how Lisp works. I'll keep working on this uh, diagram for a moment. I, I, definition of terms here, I called, I, I <laughs> kind of gave a spoiler earlier. Um, what we're doing in the Lisp world is we're taking the locator ID, really, the uh, locator identification, how to explain this. Um, the locator identifier is LI, right? And we're separating that from the, lo the locator and the identifier. Yeah, I didn't explain that very well. All right, let's just do it this way. The routing locator is going to be where my subnet lives. My identifier, this has always been my identifier. If I look at my IP address, that's how pretty much all policies are defined against me on the network. If I log in with my PC, it's they know who I am by, based on my MAC address. This is one of the problems that Cisco TrustSec and ICE tries to solve is identifying who you are, not just based on your IP address, right? 
Um, that's where we get scalable group tags and such. But ultimately, especially in traditional networking and pretty much everywhere, my IP address still is my identifier to who I am. Which is why, by the way, coming into the network over here, somebody's trying to send a packet to me. And in Lisp, that doesn't change. My identifier continues to be my IP address and specifically my subnet from a Lisp perspective. But now we introduce this concept of a locator, a routing locator, or an RLOC. The routing locator is going to be an IP address that identifies where I live inside the network. So now, and remember we talked about this concept of a destination IP address of router 10, this router 10 IP address is going to be my routing locator. So now let's just say, I don't know at this point, 10.0.0.0/24 is the subnet. And let's say that this router, okay, we're in the internet, right? We should be using public IP addresses. So let's just call this, well, I can't use 10 because I just, you know, 10's a private range. Um, we'll call this, that's, I really want to use 10 since it's router 10. Why, why did I call it router 10? <laughs> let's just call it 1.1.1.1. Why in the world not? Okay. 1.1.1.1 is the IP address, which is, by the way, a pretty popular um, DNS, uh, open DNS style uh, service these days. So I can't even use 1.1.1.1 anymore anonymously. But either way, 1.1.1.1 is the IP address in our scenario here of router 10. So when that packet is going to come in, we are going to somehow magically, and again, we'll explain this by the end, but magically this router here on ingress is going to see, okay, wait, you're destined for A. A, subnet A lives on 1.1.1.1. So I'm going to encapsulate that into a tunnel packet such that the destination is no longer 10. Dot, let's say it's just 10.0.0.1. That happens to be my IP address. We're no longer destining this packet for 10.0.0.1. We're destining it for 1.1.1.1. And again, all of the routers in my ISP domain should know where 1111 is. And whatever I, it, you know, again, I keep saying IGP, it could be EIGRP, it could be OSPF, it could be ISIS in a lot of cases, it could again be IBGP. But either way, we've advertised out to all of these routers where 10 or 1.1.1.1 lives. And so when I send my packet to the next top router, it's going to look up, do I have 1.1.1.1? Hey, I do, and it forwards it on, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so routing locator and, uh, oh, sorry. Um, the term that we use to call this identifier is actually an endpoint identifier, EID, okay? In the software-defined access world, we're gonna find that the endpoint identifier actually identifies an endpoint. In the Lisp world, for the most part, my endpoint identifier is going to be the actual subnet as opposed to an actual IP address. So in our example here, the endpoint identifier would really be pointing to 10.0.0.0 slash 24 uh, rather than 10.0.0.1, which is what would happen again in the SDA world. And the primary reason for that is, not that we need to go into a whole lot of detail here, but the reason for that is because in the Lisp world, subnets aren't going to be split around the network. If this subnet is attached to this router, I'm not probably gonna have 10.0.0.1 hanging off of this router and 10.0.0.2 hanging off of this router. In a software-defined access fabric, that's fair game because these edge devices in an SDA fabric, what are those? Those are layer three access switches. So if I roam, right? If I wirelessly roam from one network closet to another just by connecting from, you know, from that access point now to, to that access point, I've now roamed from one network closet to another well, now I've just done a layer two roam. And so I was 10.0.0.1 on that side. Now I'm 10.0.0.1 on this side. Well, in, in an SDA world, that's going to happen a lot. But in a service provider world with Lisp, we're not, we're not supporting clients being like you know, migrating around. We just, we just want to support, you know, we want to track where the subnets live. Okay. So... We're getting rid of that. Uh, 10 2 can't exist out there. It's again, the routing locator and the endpoint identifier. Those are our two primary things we need to uh, be thinking about. Okay, uh, what's next here? Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, uh, let's, do, let's do a few more terms here, okay? We have the concept of XTRs in the Lisp world. 
This stands for tunneling routers. And we have two different, the reason why it's X is because that's a variable. We have two different types of, well, yeah, yeah, we'll just say two different types for now of tunneling routers. We have an ingress tunneling router and we have an egress tunneling router. So an ITR and an ETR. In our example, the ITR is that first router. Uh, whoops, I can't spell ITR, that's ironic. All right, ITR. The packet is coming into the Lisp domain because it's coming into the Lisp domain, this is an ingress operation. So as we come into the domain and as we're about to be tunneled, the ingress tunneling router is the one that initially places it into the tunnel. Meanwhile, when I look up the routing locator and I find out, okay, that's where it's destined for, I'm gonna forward that off and this becomes the egress tunneling router. This, the ETR, is the router that pulls the tunnel packet in and de-encapsulates it. So it de-encapsulates it and forwards it on to the uh, rest of the, I guess, normal network, but the non-LISP domain, okay? All right, now we need to talk a little more detail about how all of these routers magically know all of this information, okay? Uh, let me clear out pretty much all of it, actually. Okay. Somewhere in this network, let's just, let's just make it a separate device. We're going to have a router whose job it is to track all of the endpoint identifier and routing locator mappings. The goal here is to track where all of the subnets are in the network. And we've got a lot of routing locators at this point. Let's just say all of these routers at the edge are routing locators that have subnets hanging off of them. And so we've got to track where all of the subnets are, how they're being, um, well, yeah, we need to track all of the subnets and where they live. So remember, keep in mind that we just said that we don't want to track all of the subnets on the internet routing table that will free up routers like these three in the middle to not need as many resources. But the reality is that somebody in the network does need to have that information. And that is this device right here. This device is called a mapping server, sometimes referred to the mapping server as the MS. So I'll write that out here, mapping server MS. Okay, um, now that I uh, write, write that out like that, I feel like it's just map server. I'm checking my notes here. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna go with map server. It's one of those things where you call it the MS so much that you just don't even stop and think about what it stands for. But I want to make sure that that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's in my notes. It's the map server, not mapping server. All right, good. Point being, it's the MS, right? This map server is going to be tracking all the endpoint identifier to RLOC mappings. Now, that's great, but how does it know? How in the world does it know where all of these subnets live? Well, the routers at the edge have to tell the map server when we have a subnet. So what's gonna happen is when a router comes online and it finds, now again, this is from a service provider perspective, it operates a little bit differently in SDA, um, but that's okay as we, uh, we'll cover that next week, but or next session, which is in two weeks. But either way, um, when a subnet comes online, so basically as I'm populating my routing table, every entry in my routing table is a subnet and I need to register that information with the map server. Now, there's a lot of different ways for the router to know where the map server is. Think about it from like a multicast perspective. You gotta figure out where your rendezvous point is. Um, there are ways of finding out automatically where this thing lives through DNS and such. But for the most part, uh, you know, just, just think about this as like manually configuring it. So I might configure this router manually to say here is where your map server lives. Your map server lives at, I don't know, 2.3.4.5, random IP address I just invented. So I know where my map server is. I've got a bunch of uh, uh, routes in my routing table, so I need to advertise all of these down to the map server. Um, the way we're going to do that is by sending a map register message. This map register message more or less tells, again, the map server, okay, Here's my routing locator ID. This is who I am. And here's all of the information, here's all the subnets that I have. And we're gonna get that from every single router that's out on the network within the Lisp domain. So this is at this point, from an operation perspective, we're considering this the ETR. The ETR is essentially saying, 
anybody who wants to attach to or send to any of these subnets, send it to me. I'll be the ETR in that situation. And I'll de-encapsulate the traffic and I'll forward it on. Okay. So when a packet now arrives, let's switch colors here. So now a packet has arrived on a router and it is destined for one of the subnets. Again, let's just call this subnet A. It is destined for subnet A. Now this router doesn't actually magically know where subnet A lives because again, we've, we're have we not running a routing protocol that tells it. We're running a routing protocol that it knows. I mean, in its routing table, it should have, what do we say, 2.3.4.5. We should know where 2.3.4.5 lives because we're running EIGRP or OSPF or what have you. Um, but we don't necessarily, but we, we definitely don't know where subnet A lives, at least on at the first packet I need to send to subnet A. And so I'm going to send a map request message. Hold up. I got to scroll my notes down a little bit. Oh yeah, I, yeah. We're doing this a little bit out of order. That's okay. That's okay. We're fine. Um, we're going to send a map request map request. I just skipped over some details on the tunnel. I'm going to come back to the tunnel mechanism as part of Lisp. So uh, this is fine. I, actually, it makes more sense to cover this first. So we're going to send a map request to the map server, and we're going to get back a map reply. The map request included the information of, hey, I'm trying to reach subnet A. And the map reply contains the routing locator for where subnet A lives. Now, this is kind of interesting because it changes the model for the control plane operation. First of all, it moves all the control plane information, the relevant control plane information, right? We're still running OSPF for the underlay, but as far as the overlay is concerned, we're moving all of that off box. The router here at the edge, this ITR at this point, this is the ingress tunneling router, the ITR doesn't have, to have all the information. In today's, like in a traditional network, if we're running OSPF and exchanging routes and everything, and I get a packet in and I don't have a route, I just assume, well, if I don't have a route, then I don't know where to go. I mean, it's not an assumption. That's the reality. I get a packet in. I don't have a route in my routing table. Therefore, I drop the packet because I don't have a route. But we changed the methodology here a little bit because in that methodology, I have been pushed all of the information that the network has. I've, I've received all of my LSAs if it's OSPF. I've received all of my route advertisements if it's EIGRP. I've really... I really... Re received as a word I'm trying to say. I've received all of these routes and it's great that you know, I'm, where, where was I going with that? I'm receiving, they're, they're pushing that information down to me. So basically I'm, I'm just receiving a bunch of info that's in traditional networking. In, in this more modern way of doing things where we ex, you know, extract the information, we put it onto the map server, the map server now um, is the one that has all the information. And when, so when I get a packet in and I need to know what to do with this packet, I actually reach out and I pull that information down. So it does a couple of things. First of all, it makes it as we've talked about. So these routers here in the middle can focus on forwarding, but even the routers at the edge, they don't need to know all of the information. They only need to know the information that they need at any given moment in time. So yes, there is a cache. We're going to cache some amount of information. I'm going to cache that A is attached to 2.3.4.5. And that's important because as packets continue to come in, I don't want to ha like just forget that, right? If, if I keep getting packets in destined for subnet A, well, I, I just, I'm just going to store it locally. I don't want to have to go to the map server every time. It's going to overload the map server and it's going to overload me and it's going to delay my ability to respond. And so as packets come in, um, I'm, I'm going to send those packets uh, you referencing my local cache. So the first step is not actually to do the map request. The first step is to check the cache. And if I don't have anything in my cache, that's when I check my map or I send a map request to the map server. I hope that's uh, making sense. Again, as always, chat's there. Ask your questions. Um, this is something that just takes a few times. <laughs> it's, it's new. It's a new way of doing it. We're used to the control plane living on the box. We're not used to this idea that there's a server out there that that's, again, in our case, it's a router, but we're calling it a server that serves up the information. I'm like, hey, I need to know where subnet XYZ lives. I'll just send a map request out and I'll get a map reply back. That's 
that's the idea of Lisp. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Okay, so this is where, and I'll come back now to the tunneling mechanism. So this is where the Lisp data plane comes into play. And we don't need to know a whole lot about this, but when we talk about Lisp, there are two elements. There's the control plane operation, which is exactly what we've said. We're offloading all of the control plane information to the map server, and we're going to go to the map server in order to uh, get that information. That triggered one other thing. We're going to have to come back and clarify. That's okay. Um, Lisp, the, the other component would be the data plane. At the data plane, we need to do this concept of tunneling. So what tunnel mechanism are we using? Are we using GRE? Are we using some other tunneling mechanism? And the reality is that Lisp brings with it its own tunneling mechanism. So it has its own data plane uh, operation. It is uh, what we call IP and IP. So it's a it's going to be a packet that has you know the original packet here. We'll call this the original packet. We're going to strip off the Ethernet header, which is a very important thing to remember when we talk about VXLAN later. This will come back up. We're going to strip off the Ethernet packet so now or header. So now we have an IP header. And then we have whatever layer four header we have. And then we have uh, the layer five through seven information here as our payload. That's the original packet. And then we have two things. We're going to add a Lisp shim header in here. And we're going to add a new uh, IP. Well, hold up. We're, I'm running out of space here. There, we'll just have to do it like this. We're going to add a new UDP header and an IP header. And then, of course, Ethernet, whatever our layer two protocol is, um, and not necessarily Ethernet, but um, whatever layer two is would go in front of that. Okay, so this UDP port is going to be a destination of 4341. We might need to know that on an exam, so it's worth mentioning. Um, we can do IPv4 or IPv6, so that's important. We can do version four or we can do version six here. Okay. Checking my notes here. What else is important? Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so the shim header, the Lisp header here. This is going to include a virtual network identity. Are we going with the VNID? No, we're going with, um, oh, that's right. It's called the instance ID. We are calling this the instance ID. The instance ID is essentially a way to identify uh, VRFs. So if we have different networks, different virtual networks, we don't necessarily want to, um, well, we don't necessarily want to, we absolutely do not want to share information with one VRF that um, doesn't belong with it. So a multi-tenant environment is, you know, comes to mind, uh, but that's that's primarily what we're going to use for that. Um, if, you, if you look at VXLAN later, we'll see VNID is the identifier, virtual network identifier instead of an instance ID. And it's basically the same thing. It's just for network segmentation purposes. Um, we're, we're not going to use this if it's not a multi-tenant VRF-based environment. Um, and that's it. That's it. Um, importantly, we do not use the data plane. We do not use the Lisp tunneling mechanism in software-defined access. That's um, that's why we're, using, we're going to use VXLAN instead. And we'll talk about why later. We actually already covered it a little bit. It's that layer two, layer three thing. But this is layer three only. We're not we're not sending layer two information. We stripped the original Ethernet header off, assuming it even was Ethernet when it came in. It probably was, but um, whatever layer two header information came in, we stripped that off, packaged that packet into again adding in IP header, UDP header, and a Lisp shim header. All right. Um, one other thing we need to cover really quickly, and I apologize. I really should have said this earlier. It's a mistake. Uh, there is one other component in all of this that we need to think about, and that is the map resolver. The reason I didn't bring this up is simply because the map resolver or the MR is usually, usually it's the map server as well. So in most, unless we're scaling out, and again, from a, if you're labbing this up, you'll just make them the same device. But if you are going to deploy this into a service provider space, which is not the scope of the Encore and is not the scope of any conversation we're having here today, uh, if we're not scaling out, then they can be the same device. The only difference between the map server and the map, well, not the only difference, I shouldn't say it like that. The role of the map resolver is actually to receive the map requests. Again, it's a scaling thing. 
I receive the map request, which means that the map server actually pushes information down to the map resolver. So effectively, we're, we're dividing our information up, the map or responsibilities. The map server receives all of the map register messages. And so it's processing all of that and it's managing the database. And the map resolver is handling all of the requests as they come in. But again, usually that's the same device. Usually it's the same router. Not necessarily in the service provider world, but at least from an SDA perspective, it's going to be. And from a, because um, that's going to be the, uh, the control plane node. And from uh, the Encore perspective, if we we're lab it up, they'll be the same device. But understand that there is a separation of responsibilities there. Um, should have said that earlier. Okay, we're at 35 minutes. We're about right on uh, schedule here, I'd say. Um, we got just a little bit more to cover with Lisp. And I want to make sure, yes, okay, so here we go. So, um, what, what am I trying to say here? Okay, um, next, let me just, I'll just clear all this off. And orange. Okay, eh, orange isn't a good color for this, blue. So now, next, what if, what if I have, and it shouldn't be what if, this is always gonna happen at some point, what if I have a connection to a router that isn't part of the Lisp domain? So here's my Lisp domain. We're happily running Lisp. We've got our uh, map server, map resolver combo here, the MSMR uh, that, that's doing its thing. We're taking packets in, we're tunneling them across the, the network. But now all of a sudden I've got this connection to maybe a different service provider. It's either way, it's non-Lisp. It's not running Lisp, it doesn't know what Lisp is. What am I going to do with it? Um, this, in this case, we create a new role and that is going to be the proxy XTR, okay? So PXTR. The proxy ingress tunneling router, proxy egress tunneling router just depends on whether traffic is coming into or out of the network. But the PXTR is going to handle the relationship with routers outside of the domain. For the most part, a PXTR is going to operate exactly like an XTR. The only difference really is we have to look at whether this is considered an, well, hold up real quick. Let me do, just make sure. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Um, this, the, I guess that we'll, we'll cover a little bit of this with SDA um, next week. The difference is that the PXTR is not actually registering anything with the uh, the map server, okay? So we've got some number of routes out here and probably a lot of routes. You know, I mean, if this is the rest of the internet, this is a pretty significant number of routes. Uh, if we, as we have a some kind of relationship here, maybe this is a BGP relationship, or maybe again, in service writer world, it's almost assuredly going to be a BGP relationship but it could be a GRP, it could be OSPF or something along those lines. Um, but either way, we're, we're not going to register, uh, we're not gonna register those messages. Hold up real quick. If, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, okay. I, I, my, my <laughs> I'm getting a little bit mixed up here between um, SDA, because SDA has has two different kind of uh, border nodes that they call them, which essentially are these PXTR concepts. Um, and so I wanna make sure that I get the right information from uh, a Lisp service provider perspective. Okay, ITR is gonna send it to the, yeah. So basically what's going to happen here is if I receive a packet, whoops, if I receive a packet that's destined for something and I check in with the MSMR, I send my map request, and I don't get anything back. It's basically gonna send back what they call a negative map reply, okay? I'll write this out, negative map reply. The negative map reply is going to tell the ingress router, so again, this is the ITR, is going to tell the ingress tunneling router that, hey, I don't have an entry for this. So you gotta stop and think for a moment. In a traditional environment, if I don't have a route, I'm going to drop that packet. But in a in a Lisp environment, if I don't have that route, I don't necessarily want to drop it because 
that route might exist somewhere. It just might not be part of my Lisp domain. And if it's part of, if it's uh, not, not part of my Lisp domain, I'm going to forward it to one of the proxy XTRs. Or the, yeah, proxy, I said that right. So now at this point, this is going to be a Peter instead of a Pitter, I suppose. <laughs> proxy egress tunneling router. I'm going to send that traffic to the PETR and the PT, PETR is going to, at that point, decide whether to drop it or not. In other words, it's running BGP. It's got a bunch of routes. And so maybe it does have a route outside of the Lisp domain. And maybe it does not, by the way. Maybe, maybe it doesn't know exactly where it's supposed to go. And so if it doesn't have a route at that point, it will drop it. But if it does have a route, this essentially turns the PXTR, the PETR, however you want to say it, it essentially turns this into a default route. Because what's happening is as the traffic comes in, if we don't have a destination for it, we're simply going to send it to the PXTR. That's exactly how a uh, how a default route works as well. All right. Do, 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 do. All right, so the only other thing I, I suppose is to think about the fact that now also we're getting traffic back in. So if we were to pull this up, say, okay, so traffic now is coming from the non-LISP domain, and let's say it's landing on one of these uh, PXTR. So now this is a PITR, and we're destined for, you know, something else out there, I suppose. Uh, like, let's say uh, subnet C is living off of here. PITR is going to operate exactly like an ITR at this point. It will send the map request to the MSMR, and the MSMR is going to respond back with a map reply telling it where C is. Remember, it's responding with the routing locator, the R lock. And so now the PITR knows to send it over to the router to which C is attached. Okay. Do, 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 do. Moving on. Yeah, I, I think that's it for a list. So if you have any questions about any of that, uh, be sure to chime in again to the chat. No, no real surprise if we've got a lot of questions going with this. Lisp is kind of a new animal. It, most of us don't have a whole lot of understanding of what exactly Lisp is or what the problem it's trying to solve. But I think that's the key, is if you at least keep in mind what the problem it was trying to solve, which is routing table explosion, right? And you know how we can solve that problem. And we do it using tunnels. And by tunneling out to the routing locators, we can just send traffic through there and not have to worry about every router knowing where every subnet is. That's the goal of Lisp. And so I, keeping that in mind, that'll really help us understand that. And again, walking through this scenario and this, you know, today, this is really going to help us with our SDA conversation next week, because a lot of these same concepts are going to apply to SDA. This is, again, SDA is using Lisp under the hood at the control plane, but then we're just, we're not going to package it up with Lisp in the, uh, I, we already erased it, but the tunnel packet diagram that I drew earlier. Yeah, I think that's the right word. Uh, the diagram that I drew earlier, that's for Lisp, not for SDA. All right. So what are we doing with uh, SDA at the data plane? And that is, let me just go ahead and clear all of this actually. Ooh, there we go. That would be VXLAN. We are finally ready to talk about VXLAN. We're at about almost 45 minutes. That's almost exactly right. We're here to talk about VXLAN. All right. So as with Lisp, we need to step back and think about what problems VXLAN was trying to solve. By the way, VXLAN stands for the Virtual Extensible Local Area Network. Now, sometimes it's explained as if VXLAN was meant to replace VLANs. You know, VLAN and VXLAN. VXLAN, the X is cool and new, and so it's replacing it. It's not. Saying that it's there to replace VXLANs is not a good way of describing it because it makes it sound like it's roughly the same thing. It's just, you know, VXLAN has uh, more more space, right? Uh, we've got 24 bits, which is 16 million different segments in VXLAN. And 16 million is a whole lot more than 4,096. When we go from 12 bits in VLAN to 22 bits in VXLAN, that, that sounds like, or 24 bits rather, that sounds really great, but that's not actually the value of uh, a VXLAN, it's it's certainly a value. It's not we're not simply replacing it in the exact same capacity. All right, what if what VXLAN is essentially doing is as elevating, if you will, 
um, the VLAN concept. So we had, in the, with the VLAN concept, we have 4,096 ways of segmenting our network. This is VLANs. VXLAN takes those 4,096 and equates them to a virtual network identifier or a VNID. And so because we have 4,096 VLANs and they can be part of a single VNID, well now all of a sudden we can have a second VNID and this VNID will have 4,096 VLANs. And so now all of a sudden we see that, oh well, as I scale out these VNIDs, these VNIDs, each one has the capability of supporting an entire layer two domain. Entire layer two domain being all 4,096 VLANs. So how is it doing this? Well, these VNIDs are essentially, again, ver we're segmenting the network. And the way we're gonna segment that network is by creating, guess what, another tunneled domain. VXLAN is not a network segmentation, strictly speaking, a protocol that was built for network segmentation. Yes, that's part of it, but VXLAN is a tunneling mechanism. And specifically, <coughs> excuse me, it's a tunneling mechanism that maintains, I'll write that out, maintains that layer two information. We talked about it with Lisp. When we encapsulated a packet in Lisp and from a data plane perspective, um, we scrapped the layer two information. And with VXLAN, um, first of all, we're going to build this from an ethernet perspective. VXLAN was not built for like wide area networks and things like that. So we're going to maintain the layer two info and specifically that's going to be the ethernet header. That ethernet header will stay inside of the tunnel that I build to a remote device. So uh, let's see here. So if we look at that from a, from a diagramming perspective, let's just do that now. So remember before, eh, where am I gonna draw this? Uh, right here. So let's say we've got the original payload. That'd be the layer five through layer seven info. So we've got the layer four info here, a TCP, UDP, whatever that is. And then we have the IP address. But from the original packet perspective, again, we're going to keep the ethernet header. Since we keep the ethernet header, that is, we'll just call this the original, the entire original frame. Now it's a frame, right? Because it's ethernet. And from there, now we're going to throw on a VXLAN shim header. And same thing with UDP, uh, with Lisp, we're gonna throw UDP on it and we're going to throw IP in front of that. And then assumedly another ethernet frame here. So um, the key here is that because we're keeping the ethernet header intact, we are now carrying layer two information with us across, check this out, across a layer three domain. We're actually routing at IP, this IP header allows us to route whatever's in here. And what's in here happens to be a layer two frame. So we're now routing layer two across a layer three domain. Now this, we, one thing we have to keep in mind here is that, um, and, and this is true with Lisp as well, but we need to think about MTU. And so anytime we're adding on information, or adding on headers, look, look at this, for example, like the original header, for example, because we've got the original ethernet uh, header in there, that that's no longer part of the 1500, right? I mean, the, uh, the 1500 bytes that we could support. And so now we're adding on this ethernet header and this VXLAN header and UDP and another IP header. And so this all amounts to usually 50 bytes of additional overhead. But in some cases um, with the embedded ethernet header here, if we want to, we can actually keep the VLAN header intact. And if we keep the VLAN header intact, then this actually becomes 54 bytes. One misconception in the tunneling world is that you have to increase the MTU or the tunnels won't work. And that's actually not true. Uh, the tunnels operate at layer three and IP allows for fragmentation. So if you mess this up, good news is the network will work. It'll fragment the tunnel packet, which isn't ideal, and it'll send it across the network and it'll get refragmented and life is good. And so uh, this is why deploying tunnels, in a lot of cases, you might end up kind of messing up the deployment and you'll never know about it. I mean, that's the good and bad of fragmentation is it, it makes up for your mistake, but it doesn't tell you you're making a mistake until your router CPUs are all spiking up high because it's spending all of its time fragmenting and uh, defragmenting packets. So 
we want to make sure that we do increase the MTU, not from the perspective of the tunnel won't work, but from the perspective of it will start fragmenting packets. And um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox on that. There's, <laughs> there's actually a lot of, it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there with how tunneling uh, MTU works. And so for, you know, yeah, I, I'm not going to go into it now. We don't have time to go into it. But um, what, what I'll challenge you with, if you are studying for the Encore, is go, if you've got a lab environment, open up your lab environment, build some tunnels, just GRE tunnels, you know, make tunnel interfaces, and set the do not fragment bit on pings and send them through the tunnel. You know, get onto those tunnels, because the common scenario is get onto those tunnels and set them for 1476, um, and, you know, from an MTU perspective, but it doesn't work like you think it will. So fit, play with that and do yourself a favor and get a better understanding of how MTU works from a tunneling perspective. Either way, we want to set our domain to be 54 or 50. Incidentally, by the way, SDA does not use the VLAN header, and so we only need to increase it by 50 bytes. Uh, so it should be 1550 bytes at a minimum in our underlay. And we can always just go higher. We can just do 9,000 and then life is rosy. So, but, but increasing it by 50 bytes at a minimum for SDA, 54 if you're building your own VXLAN network and intend to use the VLAN tags. Okay. So um, the, the, that's essentially it from a VXLAN perspective. But I want to paint a picture here because the way VXLAN is designed to work is it was really intended. Let me change colors here. It was intended to work inside the data center. And here's why. For those who aren't familiar with the data center, don't spend a lot of time inside the data center. We have some challenges here that we don't have in other parts of the network. Uh, for one, we want layer two communications. We talk a lot about how layer two communications is bad uh, or are bad, but layer two in the data center is important. This allows us to do things like vMotion, or more generically speaking, my live migration. It allows for storage communication. We do a lot of uh, iSCSI and um, maybe even some uh, other protocols like NFS and SIFS and such. And we want that to uh, be as much as possible at layer two. Uh, we're also, by the way, doing jumbo frames as much as possible. And jumbo frames usually is going to be a layer two concept as well. but we're applying that to storage and vMotion because they are layer two and we, uh, these are heavy hitters. Uh, on the campus network, for the most part, we, we upgrade our access layer switches to 10 gig because it makes us feel good. But how often are we using more than 100 meg on our uplinks? Not, not very often because most of our user traffic is just sending HTTP messages out to the internet or what have you. We're not doing a ton of data transfer out at the edge. In the data center, that's absolutely not true. We are doing a ton of network traffic inside the data center, and it has to be at layer two. Furthermore, we have a lot of multi-tenant data centers. Uh, multi-tenant. I'll just say multi-tenant. Um, we think about cloud at this point. If you have a cloud space and you're spinning up virtual machines for many different customers at once, then you have to worry about keeping that network tra traffic segmented. And if we have a traditional infrastructure where we've got maybe a bunch of switches here, we'll just draw two switches, and we've got customer A and customer B here and customer A and customer B on this switch. And okay, from a layer three perspective, we can definitely like carve out some VRFs and such and make sure our routing tables are split up. And, and that's great from a layer three perspective, but what about layer two? And, you know, if, if this is just a trunked connection here in the middle, and we're not even routing, we're not even hitting our routers and, and worrying about VRFs, how do we segment customer A from customer B? Well, the best way to do that is with VLANs. And so we assign VLAN 10 to customer A and VLAN 20 to customer B or what have you. And if you're a small internet, if you're a small um, service provider, uh, data center provider, then this might work. And, and we've got 200 clients and each one of those clients has four or five VLANs, right? Then, then okay, so I only need a thousand VLANs and I'm good. But for large service providers, can you imagine Amazon being restricted to the 4,096 VLANs? That's a problem in modern data centers because 4,000 is way too few. 4,096 is almost too few for some large, well, it is, it is, it is too large 
or too few VLANs for some enterprises. Um, network segmentation, we're, we're segmenting our own networks. And so as our service provider environment here just spins up, we need more than 4,000, what are we going to do? And the solution up until this point is to segment with private VLANs or, you know, again, to have come up with some sophisticated mechanism. So I know that, um, you know, this router over here or this switch over here, maybe it has VLAN 10 assigned to customer C, knowing that VLAN 10 has been removed from the trunks that go over to the other switches or what have you. And that means that I can't have uh, A10 over here. I can only have C10 on this switch and A10 on that. I mean, it gets to be a nightmare uh, how we split up our VLANs. And so VXLAN was designed to solve a lot of these problems. Um, there are other problems with the data center that, uh, you know, from an aggregation perspective, data center pods and such scaling out at layer three um, that I'm not going to go into at this point, but just understand that this layer two is so important that as we scaled our data centers out and we, again, we hit our limits and we needed to put layer three boundaries in the side the data center, that that kills our ability to do layer two. You know, if I, if I've got two data center pods that are connected at layer three and I need to do a V motion from uh, one physical server in one pod to a physical server in the other pod, well, that's just not going to work from a layer two perspective. And likewise, if I need to send storage, attach storage between the two at layer two, I, I don't have layer two, it's layer three. And so VXLAN was developed to solve a lot of these problems for us. Um, this usually is going to go part and parcel with a leaf spine architecture. This leaf spine architecture makes it so that I've got spine switches on one layer, leaf switches on another layer, we do not connect spines to spines. We do not connect leaves to leaves. And the way this is going to work is this becomes a layer three fabric inside, you know, between spines and leaves. And because I'm connecting between spines and leaves, here, let me do it like this, or show this. Um, this domain in here is going, should, should already start to look, this should already start to look a little bit familiar at least. Um, and really what I should do is draw it like this to include the spine switches. Um, this is an underlay. And I'm going to start building my tunnels between my, uh, well, leaf switches. I'm going to start building my tunnels like this, such that now I've got segmentation between my, my network, no, bleh, between my access layer switches. So I've got layer three segmentation between my layer three switches. And so now I've got these tunnels built and spoiler alert, uh, these are VXLAN tunnels. And VXLAN can carry layer two information, which means that I can have uh, a client on A on VLAN 10 on this switch. And here's the interesting thing. I can have another client, client B, on a completely different VLAN locally. So I've got VLAN 20 over here, but because they're part of the same VXLAN identifier, that virtual network identifier, which lives here. I guess we never clarified that. I apologize for that. This VNID, which is a 24-bit value. Yeah, that's, that's the right. 24-bit value, which gives us 16 million um, VLANs or v, VNIDs, VXLANs, there we go. Um, because I've got these uh, different VNIDs, I can connect these two from a layer two perspective, which means that now I, I have 4,096 different segmentations per access layer switch or per leaf switch. And so this is how the world of VXLAN is solving problems inside the data center. It's really what it was designed to do. I don't need to worry about layer two anymore because even if I have layer three pods, I can build tunnels through those. And leaf spine kind of gets rid of, no, it doesn't get rid of the idea of the pod, but it certainly makes it less of a requirement that I move to pods. My pods can be a lot larger with leaf spine. Um, the multi-tenancy, not a concern anymore because I'm not going to run out of VLAN IDs. I've got 4,096 per switch basically. And so I can handle that, no problem. And so it solves all these problems in the data center, but Cisco is paying attention to VXLAN. And so when we looked at LISP and said, okay, that's great for the service provider that I'm doing layer three tunneling, but then I look at my campus infrastructure and my campus infrastructure, I need layer two tunneling because I need just the same reason I do layer two out to my access layer closets. I need VLAN 10 to live on every single one of my closets. And maybe VLAN 10 is a particular subnet or what have you. Now, if I change that to a layer three design, and I'm going to build tunnels between my access layer switches, which is what software-defined access does, 
If I'm going to do all of that, then I need a tunneling mechanism that can carry layer two information. And so what we're going to find next week as we walk through SDA fabric operation is that we're going to leverage LISP, all the things we talked about today from a LISP perspective at the control plane. And then we're going to leverage VXLAN to build the tunnels that will allow me to carry layer two information back and forth among my edge switches. So, whew, that was a, uh, a lot, quite a bit actually. Um, from uh, uh, yeah, Lisp and VXLAN. There's there's always more. There's always more to cover with these protocols. Um, there's certainly some more information that we could have talked about with Lisp or VXLAN, but um, it's not the purpose of a one-hour study session is to pump you full of all of the information. Uh, certainly on CBT Nuggets website, uh, I go into if in fact there's dedicated skills to each one of these to Lisp and to VXLAN. So uh, quite a bit of content just dedicated to these two different protocols for those who have. A CBT Nugget subscription. Uh, for those who don't, if you're studying your way through the uh, OCG, there's plenty of information and in that the official certification guide is what OCG stands for, for those who are wondering. Um, again, this is what we need to understand from an Encore perspective. If, we're, if our goal is to pass the CCNP and to get the Encore um, uh, uh, en route to getting the CCNP, then this is plenty of information. This will get you probably where most of the way where you need to go. Again, with the goal not being Lisp and VXLAN, because you're not likely to get a whole lot of questions on Lisp and VXLAN on the exam, uh, but with the goal being how does SDA work, because fair game to get asked about a software-defined access on the Encore. Um, so thank you very much for joining everybody. For those who are watching live, I'm gonna stick around and uh, the chat, answer any questions that you may have over the next five or 10 minutes. So uh, otherwise, hope everyone has a great rest of your week. We'll see you in two weeks uh, for the next session, which again is, SDA fabric operation. Until then.